Lila Rose. She can't stop lifting the word love to its rightful place. Due to her immense love for children and the unborn, she founded Live Action, one of the most successful pro-life organizations around the world. Lila and her team at Live Action have shed further light on the deception and the brutality of the abortion industry. And she did it all before she could drive. When she was 15 years old, she was strategizing about how to bring down the horrific abortion industry and to save millions of lives because she was young and courageous and life cannot wait. Lila is such an incredible example of courage and strength. And as horrible and as brutal as the abortion industry is, she gives me so much hope and faith that in good time we will see its demise. Ladies and gentlemen, with great pleasure, let us please give a warm welcome to Lila Rose. And so I've come to speak with you from the perspective of someone doing work primarily in the United States, but with the understanding that the birthplace of abortion in the United States largely is here in New York City. One of the flagships of the largest abortion chain in our nation is the Margaret Sanger Center within just three miles of where we are tonight. And so what happens and what the United States has done when it comes to children in the womb, when it comes to the way that women and our, our dignity and our motherhood is treated here does impact the rest of the world. And I also speak to many of you coming from other countries asking for your forgiveness because of the way that my nation has exported a very violent and against the most innocent theology to many countries across the world. So I want to first say that because there are some brave nations in the United Nations that have been battling for life in their countries, but they're too often ignored by some of the other voices like my country. So I want to start with that. And I realize that if we don't treat the weakest members of our society with the respect that we want for ourselves, how is that justice? How is that equality? How is that upholding human rights? Blessed Mother Teresa, who's a Nobel Peace Prize winner and a hero of mine, and she's someone who was respected and loved for her work with the lepers and the lonely and the dying, the work with the hungry. And yet, Mother Teresa, whenever she had the opportunity, had very strong words to say about abortion. And she said this to a group of American politicians in the 90s. She directed the statement. She said that the greatest destroyer of peace in the world is the cry of the innocent unborn child. She called it the greatest destroyer of peace. Why would she say that? Because when you take the child who's in their weakest situation, their most dependent situation, the, the weakest members of our society, and you deny them their most fundamental human right, and that's denied by the people closest to them who should, who should love them and who should protect them and who should fight for them, then you have a human rights issue, a human rights crisis at the core of your society, and you cannot have peace. You cannot have the peace that you hunger for. And Mother Teresa understood that, and so she bravely stated that. And whenever she had the opportunity, she would state that again and again. So as a teenager recognizing all of this, and I think many of us here have, a, have some kind of recognition of this, I thought, this is something I have to fight for. This is something that I have to stand for. And if I care about human rights, if I care about my nation, if I care about peace, then this is something I have to direct my attention to. And then, of course, as I started activism and I started doing work to educate, I realized all the lies that are being told. I mentioned abortion mythology. I want to get into that a little bit more. I mentioned your body, your choice. And what that's really saying to the woman is it's denying the life within her and saddling her entirely with the care, with the concern of that child, right? So it's been a tool that's been said, oh, women are empowered by this. Now they have control, autonomy over their bodies. And yet what it's doing is it's relegating the care, the concern for the future of the nation, which is children, to the woman. And you have to deal with it, it's telling her. And look at what's happened in my country because of that. And my country prides itself on our freedom and prides itself on our advancement and our civil rights battle for, first of all, to rid ourselves of slavery and then discrimination and our, 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 right, our, our battle for women's rights. And we're still, there's many talks, talk about still fighting that battle. 
And yet in all that talk that we tell the world and we tell ourselves, all those talks by folks like Hillary Clinton and the Speaker of the House or former Speaker of the House Nancy Pelosi and many others, all of this talk from leaders, including groups that claim to speak for women in my country, like Planned Parenthood, like NARA, like the National Organization for Women, there's a, there's a, for, a complete denial, a complete forgetfulness of what it means to be and the beauty that it means to be a mother and the gift that life is to society. And instead, children are pitted against their mothers. And there's an animosity that's created. And then that wedge is deepened because all of a sudden it's your body, your choice, and women are the ones to deal with that. One of the things that has been very disappointing about Planned Parenthood in the United States has been their complete rejection of banning sex selective abortion. I'm not sure how many people are aware of this, but one of the challenges that we're facing in the United States and other, other countries across the world is what The Economist has called the war on baby girls. And there's over 100 million missing girls in the world today because of sex selective abortion, killing off children in the womb, particularly little girls, because they're not seen as, as valuable as men, as valuable as boys. And this, I, I'm not sure this is even talked about in all of this entire conference. It needs to be a core issue because one of the biggest threats, the biggest killers of girls today, attacks on women today, is sex selective abortion. And I want to show just a few, if we can pull up that video, just a few minutes of an investigation that we did on sex selective abortion, showing how Planned Parenthood, as the biggest abortion provider in this country, helps to collaborate to do sex selective abortions. And they're actually an, or an organization that has fought against bans on sex selective abortion. Even India, which has a problem with sex selective abortion, has banned it. But the United States is one of the only countries in the world up there with North Korea and Canada, which refuses to ban sex selective abortion. And the reason for that is because groups like Planned Parenthood, which claim to speak for women, are the groups advocating on behalf of it. I wanted to share one other video with you that's three minutes, and it shows a little peek of what's happened. It's, I call it the Wild West of abortion in the United States. And again, this is top on the agenda, up there, very high on the agenda of many of the groups, even here at this time when we're all coming together to talk about the status of women as somehow to promote the welfare of women which is uh, against a woman in every way. It's against a woman physically, it's against a woman emotionally, psychologically, it's against a woman's dignity to turn her against her flesh and blood. But keep that in mind as you watch this video because all of the groups that are promoting abortion as somehow a form of empowerment, although it does anything but empower a woman, a woman doesn't walk into an abortion clinic feeling powerful. She walks into an abortion clinic feeling powerless no woman wakes up and says, I want to have an abortion today. It's my right and I'm going to go do it. They wake up and they think that they need to have an abortion because they feel a pressure or they feel they somehow are being told by society there's no other way for them to advance. I remember being in my health center undercover on another investigation at UCLA, which is this university that claims to promote equality. And I'm in the health center and I'm undercover as a student, I was a student, but I was saying that I thought I was pregnant. And the UCLA nurse said to me, point blank, that UCLA doesn't support women who are pregnant or help them necessarily, but that there were two abortionists that I could go see. And adoption was difficult and I would embarrass my classmates if I was in the classroom and I was pregnant. And so therefore I should go get an abortion. She doesn't care about my future, my, my, my true choice. She cared about abortion, and that was her agenda for me. So as you watch this next video, think about all the groups that claim to speak for women, that claim to care for women, that claim to care for human rights, and yet this is the kind of thing that they're advocating for, and the manipulation and the lies that are being told to women in the clinics, as much as on media, on, on universities, lies about what abortion is, lies about how it may or may somehow be helpful to us. We're all here to discuss the status of women, to discuss threats to women. We're all here because we care about women. We care about not just women's rights, but we care about human rights, right? It's not that we're dividing rights here and there, but we are, what unites us is our humanity. 
What unites us is our humanity and to be human is enough. To be human is enough to secure us a place of respect and protection in any society. And I think anybody here at this time and all the different sessions that are being had would agree with that, that our humanity unites us and that our dignity, our equal dignity before God, before the law, before each other is what we share. And so what I wanna leave you with is as we struggle to ensure that women are treated with equal dignity and that they are advanced, especially in places where they are under threat. And I speak especially to the women here that as we advocate for this and the men who come on, beh on our behalf to advocate as well, that we don't make the mistake of as we try to achieve our protection, try to achieve our adv advancement of relegating a whole other people group, those that are even weaker than us and more vulnerable, our children, that we don't reject them and leave them behind. But instead we embrace a vision together that we can do better than abortion, that women deserve better than abortion, and that our children are not a threat, but a gift. And that is part of the dignity and the beauty of our voice as women. Thank you. <laughs>